All right, so we obviously saw strings are a little different than your integers, your floats, your booleans, right? Because a string is actually like a collection of characters. But we can generalize this. And you've seen this already in assignment one and in assignment two, assuming you're working on it, where in assignment one we had a list of Starbucks locations. Assignment two, you have lists that represent cities. And what's interesting about an assignment, raise your hand if you've started assignment two or you've read through it. All right, if you haven't, oof. actually, no, I moved the deadline back. You're okay. You're okay so far. I don't know, whatever it says online. I'm not deflecting, I just genuinely, I don't know, just whatever it says. Um, what's neat about assignment two is you have a list where you've got a name of the city, the city's status, and then another list within the list that's uh, the list of the city's neighbors, which is neat. Anyways, <clears throat> we could generalize the idea of a list. So here, I'm just going to take this code, paste, run. I've got some list, 5, 7, 9, 10. I can print out the list. We see it. I can index the list, get a specific element at some specific index. I can do that slicing thing, which is pretty neat. I'm saying give me everything from index 1 up to, but excluding index 3. The end index is always exclusive. And <clears throat> we can even see, well, what's the type of some list? Well, it's a list. It, it, it's its own type. Now, some other questions might come up, like, well, can you have a list that has different types in it, like a 1, 1.1, 1 .1, true, print a. Well, yeah, we can. You can even mix types inside the list, which is neat. What else? Uh, can you access the last element in the list? Well, there's a couple ways we can do that. You know, the traditional way of accessing the last element of a list is, well, index with the length of a, except will this work? So first of all, what's the length of A? This, you can all count. We've established this already this semester. Someone yell out, what is the length of A? Four. four. Very good. So what's A at index four? What? Nothing. It, it doesn't actually exist. Because remember, the length of the list is how many things are in the list. The indices are, well, what's the offset from the start of the list? If the length is 4, we have index 0, 1, 2, 3. That is a total of four things. So if I wanted to access the last element, I can't say, give me a at the index of the length of the list. No, what do I have to modify about this? Yeah, the length minus 1. If the length is always one bigger than the last index, well, then the last index is just going to be the length minus one. It's the true. Or in Python, you can even just do minus one. Now, this is a Python thing. I'm sure there's other some programming languages like this. But your other popular similar programming languages, you're not, I, I'm not familiar with this. At least it's not in the language yet. Maybe it gets updated in the future. But indexing backwards is possible in Python. But of course, it really is just syntactic sugar for this. And remember, when I use that phrase, syntactic sugar, all that means is it's syntax for some functionality where the syntax is just a little nicer than like another way. So this is code to get the last element where this is also code to get the nice last element, but it's a little bit nicer, one might argue. <clears throat> now, we can get the length of a list, as we obviously know. And here's something interesting. Remember how we can have a, a remember how like, 
A. Based on this code, what is A? What type is A? It's a, it's a string, and it's an empty string, actually. Because an empty string is still a string. It's just there's nothing there. And its length is 0. And what's kind of nice about this is, like, I can, like, append. I can concatenate the strings. A equals A plus. Here, let me, let me show you something neat here. There's nothing in this code that should scare you. Plus equals, what does plus equals mean? Plus equals means like a equals a plus something. So we used plus equals with arithmetic before, like with integers. But you could do it with strings, too. So the first time through this loop, i will be 0. And so what is a equals a plus the string 0? What is an empty string concatenated with the string 0? Yeah. And then, so now a is the string 0. Next time to the loop, i will be 1. What is the string 0 concatenated with the string 1? 0, 1, yeah. So if I run all this, you know, there we go, 0 through 9. So th this type of thing is like, like string building. I can't start with, the reason, like, an empty string is important here because, like, well, what do I start with, right? I, I need to start with something. Well, I'll start with an empty string. Anyways, that's not overly important right now. If we go back to this, if we can have an empty string, we can have an empty list. A is a list. There's just nothing in it, and that's fine. Here's an important one, too. A equals A, B, C, D. Oops. Oh, my goodness. OK. Look at this code. Make sure it makes sense. Nothing about this should be weird. I've got some list. And then I'm saying print out the value <coughs> of that list at index 2. Well, that's 0, 1, 2. That's the C. Remember, we could do this with strings. But with strings, remember, strings were, what was that special word we used for strings? It might not be obvious because the context might not be clear. But strings are immutable. We can't actually go into a string and change anything about that string. We can access individual elements from a string, just like we're doing here with a list. But with a string, we can't go into the string and change anything about the string. But I wonder if we can do that with, with uh, Does it look like we could do it with lists, though? Yeah. So unlike strings, with lists, lists are mutable. We can go in and actually change the contents of that list. Now, here's a couple things I'll say about mutable and mutable. We like immutableness. Programmers really like when you can't go in and change things. Once something's created, you leave it alone. Now, there are some arguments. Once something's created, you leave it alone. If you need to change something about it, tough. You can't. Instead, what you could do is make a copy of it, and while making the copy, you make the change you want. But you have to leave it alone. Don't touch it. We like it to be immutable. When things are immutable, it's easier to reason about your code. It's easier to keep track of values. It's easier to avoid mistakes. There's a lot of mistakes and a lot of headaches, especially as we keep going. 
a lot of headaches can arise when dealing with mutable things. There, yeah, there's an argument that you might, one could make an argument that like, well, you know, if you're always making copies of things, if you want to make a change, you're doubling the amount of space you've used. And you're using, you're, that means your program's using more space on your computer, it's taking up more RAM, isn't that a bad thing? Yeah, if it's 1980 and we're writing these types of programs, but for our purposes right now, we're not too worried about it. That only becomes an issue when performance really is a bottleneck. Like if you're making video games or something and you're really trying to push the limits of what that processor can do, okay, fine. What, what that processor and what that system can do, yeah, okay, maybe you're aware of those things. But in general, for, the types of soft, for most types of software, we don't like the, the, the mutableness. However, there's a big exception. And this isn't, a, a, and I'm not asserting this exception is always the case. You don't have to do it this way. But often when it comes to things that we call data structures, like a list, we do like the mutableness. Because the point of a data structure is it's a place to store data. It might have a state. We can go manipulate the state of that data. And there. When we have immutable things, those, those like strings don't really have, it's not very stateful. The value the string has is the value it has, and that's the state it will ever have. You can't go in and change its state. It's always just going to be like that. But with data, data structures, we've got, like, they're very stateful. And that's by design based on what we're using them for. And you can even go look at the assignment, too, for an example of how we're accessing and manipulating data. Although, be careful, because in assignment two, I actually do, I tell you to it in such a way that we, we try to avoid the statefulness. In fact, that's why if you're reading through the assignment description, you'll notice a lot of things where it's like, make a copy of the city. Make a copy of the world and manipulate the copy. Don't, if something exists, you leave it alone. So even though the data structures are mutable, I'm even telling you to do assignment two in such a way where you're kind of treating them as if they are immutable. If you've started assignment two, depending on how far you've gotten, this may have made a lot of sense to you. If you haven't gotten that far yet, maybe this will make sense when you get there. But a list is, a, is an example of a data structure. This is our first real data structure. And it's actually a great one. It's a very general one. It's fantastic. It's linear. It's a great place to just store some data. So it's not really an algorithm. It's just a collection of data, right? Now, algorithms and data structures go together. You write algorithms to work with data structures. You can design data structures around how you want your algorithm to work. Pardon me. So they are linked, but a list is a data structure. And what's neat about a list is, well, it can store a lot of data. We can store a lot of data in there. We can store a bunch of different types in there. We can index the data and retrieve specific things. We can modify specific values in there. And what's neat, too, about it is there's an orderedness to the data. Now, I don't mean the data is sorted. That's not what I mean. What I mean is the value at index 0 comes before the value at index 7, right? There is an order that persists. That doesn't mean it's necessarily sorted, though, of course. But yeah, lists are great. They're very general. Now, I will give you a heads up, though. Like, raise your hand if, you're, if you are or you're thinking of taking 162. OK, so for those of you. In 162, 162 is actually called like data structures. The focus of that course is learning a lot about data structures. Obviously, there's a lot of algorithms that go with it. And a list is actually a very general data structure. At the start of 162, we actually take a couple of steps back and start with even simpler ones and work our way to back towards things like lists. And there's a good reason for that. And you might think, well, why would we use a less powerful version of a data structure? And in programming, we often want to use the right tool for the job. And just because you have a, 
If I can solve a problem with a screwdriver, I don't need to go grab a whole toolbox with a power drill in it either, either right? Like, I, that will work, but you know, we use the right tool for the job. Keep it simple. And computer scientists often really love to geek around, geek, get really geeky about, here's a really simple little thing. Here's a very simple data structure, for example. We'll start with stacks at the beginning of 162. What can I do with it, though? Right? It's, it's less powerful than a list, but what can I do with it? What, what interesting things can I do with that thing? And then we go like, well, what if I, I change it a little bit to add a little bit more ability to that thing? Now what can I do with it? Computer scientists love that shit. So you'll see if you're in 162. All right. So all right. So here. Give, give me one sec. I want to check uh, mutability loops and lists. Yeah, OK, perfect. I'm just going to do this one here real quick, so we'll do it together. I want to do a linear search. This is a linear search that's going to return the index of something. And we did linear searches on strings. We can do them on a list as well, obviously. You effectively did for assignment one. You were searching through that linear collection, the list of Starbucks locations, to check how many fell within that box, right? So let's just do it here for a list. For for element in haystack, if if the current element I'm looking at returns something, you know, here return true. Right? Does this look correct? I mean, this will tell you if the thing exists or not. But actually, that's not what I actually asked for here. This function is supposed to tell me the index of the thing I'm looking for. Right? And, and if I don't find the thing, I want to return negative 1. Oops. Um, I got a problem, though, don't I, with this for loop? How do I get the index of that element? I've got the element. That for loop will give me the thing at the beginning of the list, and the next thing, and then the next thing, and then the next thing, and then the next thing. But it does, the value of element is going to be one of the elements within the list. It's not the index of the thing. So how do I get the index? Does anyone have any ideas? I mean, that, well, we can solve this problem. Here's, here's what we can do. We can create some counter, like, OK, current index starts at 0. And then every time the loop ends, every time the loop run once, we'll just increment that. There. This should do the trick. Let's see. Oops, no, this was supposed to be a list. A, B, C, D. Negative one, oh. <laughs> there. So this will work, right? Now, if you think, and, and the reason I'm showing you, I mean, there's several reasons I'm showing you this particular example here, is How would I have known I needed another variable to keep track of the index? Well, you're not supposed to just know that you need that. If that was your train of thought, you're doing it wrong. You're not supposed to just know. The problem is, I need the current index. How can I get the, I need a way to keep track of the current index. OK, I can make a variable to keep track of the current index. OK, I'll, I'll make a variable. You're not supposed to just know. 
You're supposed to go, what's the problem? How can I solve it? You got a lot of tools in your tool belt. We're at the stage of the semester where you know enough that you are aware of what you don't know. And so because of that, sometimes you get in this paralysis of, well, maybe I just don't, I just don't know the, the way to do it. So you kind of, you, you get this paralysis of like, I just, uh, you get kind of stuck and, you, and you're, you're limiting yourself. No, 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 no. You actually know a remarkable amount already. So the question you need to ask yourself is, what do I need? How do I do it? What do I need? I need to keep track of the current index. How can I do it? I can make a variable to keep track of the current index. All right, I'll do that. There are other ways I can do it too. But, you know, when I look at this one here, you know, the whole point of using the for loop, here, let me go show you something here. This right here, the way I have this code, should look a lot like this. Should, should remind you of something like this. And that'll also work. I just switched the for loop to a while loop. But, you know, when using a for loop the way I was originally, I, I want to be careful to not really say the purpose of that for loop. No, the purpose of the for loop is to loop. But that for loop is kind of syntactic sugar for a while loop because it eliminates the need to have to have a counter. So when I made a counter to also go in the for loop to count, I'm kind of like negating the whole like fanciness of the for loop. If you, if you wrote, uh, if I had on a test or an assignment, you gave me a solution this, and I know it's called index of four, but if I, said, if I didn't specify you had to use a for loop, and you did this, you're absolutely correct. One is not more correct than the other, just one was supposed to have like the nice syntax for the for loop which we've kind of obliterated here. So maybe like a for loop wasn't the best choice for this particular thing in terms of, it's not even that it's not the best choice. It's, there's little argument to say a for loop is nicer syntax than a while loop for this particular problem. But we'll revisit this in a moment. So just some things to note about lists. You can concatenate them with addition like strings by the way. You can multiply them with themselves to have them repeat. And remember, at the end of the last topic, where I told you, take the string and say dot, and we see a whole bunch of stuff. What do we call these things? Methods. And if you remember, methods are just functions, but they're associated with a class, a type. These are methods for, these are functions that all work on lists. They are for lists. And in order to call these functions, in order to invoke these methods, we have to have an instance of a list. A, in this example, would be the instance of a list, meaning I've got A, and you know, it's, it's a list. Kind of, but we'll get there soon. So on that instance, I then say, okay, call this method. And the instance I'm calling it on is kind of like the implicit argument, meaning if I say count, so count is a method, return the occurrence of a number of values, let's count how many sixes there are in there. So I gave this method the argument six, but this method also had access to the list. It would be like I had a function called count, and I, was, I would give it a list and the thing I wanted to count in it. Oops, six. 
But there is no function count, but there is a method. So I would call it like this. But A is the implicit argument because this method can act on A. And 6 is an explicit argument because it's, it's there. I've, I've given it to you. It should be obvious. Here, they're both explicit. But this would be as if count was a function, not a method. And like I said last time, if you look at this and you go, how am I supposed to remember this? I hate this. Computer scientists have to have good memory. <laughs> no, no. You go count occurrence of count occurrences of lists and oh, using the count method. Oh, great. Looks like there's a okay. Let's see. Right. That's how you do this. I'm not like the only way. It would be cruel for me to ask you to memorize what function, what's a function and what's a method just arbitrarily. The only way I would ever ask you something like that on a test in a position where you wouldn't be able to quickly look it up is if it's something that like there's no way in hell you don't know this. Okay? Like soon you're going to be using the append method for lists a lot. So by the end of the semester, if I'm the final, I'm like, OK, append something to a list. You're going to know, if you've been doing your shit, you're going to know append exists. But in general, I'm not going to, like, I, I will be as clear as possible in the question description. And even if you mixed up and you assume something was a function and not a method on the test, in general, I'm probably going to be like, yeah, whatever, you know what you're doing. If you, if you ran it like that or if you had access to the internet and you were doing this in practice, you'd figure it out. So don't worry too much about that. If you're, if you're all worked up about how am I going to memorize the difference, how, how was I supposed to know that wasn't a method and a function or that wasn't a function but a method for the thing? You're not. Maybe you'll figure it out if you have to use that method a lot and it, you will eventually memorize it. But in general, don't try to memorize these things. Just look them up like I just showed you. That's the right way to program. The wrong way is to, like, you'll, you'll drive yourself crazy if you're trying to memorize all this stuff. All right, mutability, I already talked about that. You can change them. So, <coughs> now, oops. For loops, they, they work on lists, just like they did with the strings, for each thing in some collection of things. <clears throat> All right? <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me, here's a little thing about for loops. And I know most of you have seen this already because you've, you went ahead and you figured it out and a lot of people in lab are already doing it. But there's a, and I showed you at the beginning of the topic, When I wrote this code for thing in range 10, what do we see? Well, the loop ran for all the numbers starting at 0 up to but excluding 10. If I made this 100, what do you think it's going to go up to? Yell it out. Of course, right? 0 through 99. Checks out. Good. So this is a really easy way. This is, if I wanted it before, if I was using a while loop and I wanted a loop to run like 10 times, you know, I'd start a counter while the counter is less than 10, do something, increment the counter. Well, now, look, there's an even easier way to do it with the for loop. What's neat, too, about a for loop is you can actually specify where to start. Start at 5, but go up to and exclude 10. And there's even an option for a third one. The third one is, what do I count by? Start at 5, go to 10, counting by 2s. Any questions about that? So that's why 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then, if I, even if I were to make this try to go to 11, 
it wouldn't get to 11, because it would try to go to 11, but 9 plus 2 is 11, but we don't want to include 11, so you know it gets skipped. All right? Neat, right? So now, actually, if we go back up here, if we go here, now I've got another way to do this. I'm going to get rid of that current index. Actually, no, I'm going to have it in range. But how do I find, like, I want this loop to run some number of times. If I have a list of size 10, how many times do I want this loop, loop, uh, loop to run for a linear search? 10. If it's size 20, how many times do I want the loop to run? 20. How do I find out the length of the thing I want to look at? Len. Oh, right here. What's the length of the haystack? All right, run that many times. And then here, obviously, I can't do element. I would have to do at current index. And that'll work, too. So now we've got a little nicer, nicer way to bring back the for loop by using range. We're still indexing the elements like this. But you know, we don't need that separate counter anymore because the loop kind of has that count, the for loop has that counter like built in, which is neat. But this is, this feels a little different though, right? Because with a for loop before, for thing in it was nice for each, for each thing in a collection of things. But when I do it with range 5, the, the for loop seems to be a very different type of for loop. It's not for each thing in a collection of things. It's for the numbers 0 through 5 exclusively. Right? You, it feels different. But here's the thing. It really isn't. Because this is equivalent to writing For each thing in the collection of things, it's just the collection of things is a list of the integers that you want them to be. It's just range is syntactic sugar for making a list like that. In fact, you can even, if you want to create a list of all the numbers between something, you can do that easily. In fact, this was even easier in Python 2. In Python 3, you have to like do this. What? What's going on? Why is it mad? Because I can't spell print? Okay. So this is actually there. I created the list of the numbers 0 through 99 with range. Because range actually is just like a function that does that for you. So even though it looks like that for loop is different, it looks like it's like a counting for loop as opposed to a for each element in a collection of things. The counting for loop really is a for each loop. But it's all just, remember, it's all just syntactic sugar. <clears throat> now, okay, here's a, uh, yes. Let's do this as an activity. Write a function, beer on wall, that prints out n bottles of beer on the wall for all n from 99 down to 0. This function must use a for loop with the range function. The challenge for you right now is, I'm going to give you like three, four minutes to try this one. The challenge with this is counting backwards, but see if you can figure it out.
Raise your hand if you got it. Raise your hand if you're like, I'm really close. I just can't figure out what. All right, yeah. So here's what I have. But of course, this isn't correct. Because I'm starting at zero. We're not putting beer on the wall. We're taking it down. So I can't just say for current beer in range 100. Really, I want to I wanna start at 99 and go down to like zero. But if I run that, who here did something like this and saw it doesn't run? Now range, you know, counts up. So let me ask you, how many numbers are there? How many, this loop, will run for the number of numbers between 99 and 0 counting like up. So how do I get, how many numbers are there greater than 99 but less than 0? So the loop's running no times, right? If I said start at 0 and go to 99, how many numbers are there bigger than zero but less than 99? Well, that's the number of time the loop's going to run. So I can't go from 99 to zero by counting up. Does anyone have an idea? Well, instead of counting up, remember I showed you that, that secret third argument, which is what do you count by? Well, by default, it counts by one. What do I want to count by here? Negative one. This is a trick. If this wasn't immediately obvious to you, now you know. But I, I remember the first time I saw this, I was like, oh, yeah, I guess it makes sense, but it really wasn't immediately obvious. Can, uh, can you be more specific? It would, it would re there, there's, a, there's a lot of, it depends, involved with that answer. So it would really depend on how you want to go about doing it, but maybe. But that wouldn't be how I, I would go about doing it. I think that would be a lot of extra work. Did it work? It worked a bit? Hey, <laughs> that's not bad. So the trick here is to count by negative ones. So we start with 99 bottles of beer on the wall, and we go all the way down to 
one bottles of beer. Because remember, it's always go up to but exclude the last number. So maybe what I should do is when the loop's done, there, we're out of beer. Any questions about that range thing there? Now, okay, look. If we go back to here, yeah, all right? This, this, this works. This uh, linear search works. But range of the length of haystack, and then if I want the element, I have to index the element from the haystack. You know, one of the big nice things of the for loop is it's, it's like, like a for each loop, for each thing in a collection of things. And now I'm using a for loop in a way where it's really like it is doing that, but now the collection of things I'm iterating over is like a list of integers, not the collection of things I, I want to search. So like I'm using a for loop just fine, but it's, it's being used kind of in a roundabout way for the thing I want to actually search over. And there's nothing wrong with this. I want to be very clear this is 100% correct. But Python gives us another fancy way Another thing for you to remember, called enumerate. In fact, by the way, usually it, as convention, so I know I'm really big on have good variable names, but sometimes there are variable names, like having one letter variable names is typically a terrible idea. There are some conventions though, for example, in a loop, to keep track of the current index, usually what you use is just i. I means index, okay? So that would be one example of usually people use I. Oops. There. There's another special thing called enumerate. We are going to enumerate the haystack. And what's really weird here is the fact that I actually have two variables over here, i and element. When you enumerate over something, i will be the number, like the current iteration of the loop, which in this particular case will also correspond to the index, and the element will be the thing in the loop. Sorry, the thing in the collection. So I can use element to check if it's needle, and then return i because it's the index. So this is just even more syntactic sugar for doing what we wanted to do. The functionality is exactly the same. Doing it any of the variations of the way I showed you is perfectly fine. But this is perhaps the, the cleanest when it comes to the code. Let me show you some variations here. Okay, I want... If... All right, fine. For thing... Here, A equals... Here, we can use this one here. For thing in A, I get the things, right? When I do it like this, I just change, I could have called it thing, doesn't matter, I'm calling it I now. When I do it like this, I get the, like the, which, time the loop is running, which in this case could correspond to the indices of that collection, so much so that a at index i, you know, the zeroth time through the loop, I got the a, because it was at, you know, it's the thing at index zero. The next time through the loop, i is one, and the thing at index one is b, and so on. 
any questions about what we're seeing right here. I just, I took i, I printed out i, and I also printed out a at index i. And in case you missed it, that's a. Any questions about this? Now, enumerate just allows us to do this in an arguably cleaner way. The first time through the loop, we have zero, because it's the first time it's running, and we get the thing at the beginning. This becomes one, we get the next thing. Two, we get the next thing. Three, we get the next thing. Four, we get the next thing. That's why we see zero A, one B, two C, three D, four E. Enumerate lets us do this, but with nicer code arguably. If you like enumerate, use it. If you look at this and you're like, I hate it, fine, don't use it. It doesn't matter, but I would argue this is nicer. Any last questions? All right, I'll see you later. Remember, any questions, thought, concerns, you want to chat, come see me at student hours. Wait, you have a question. For the next midterm, I was actually going to send the email right before lecture, but I didn't have enough time. It's going to be, you know what, look forward, I'll let you look forward to the email, because I don't want to make sure, I want to make sure I don't change my mind between now and the email, so you'll see. <laughs>